morning. My name is Peggy Lagodny, and I'm a worship associate of this congregation, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. Welcome to our morning online worship as we navigate the waters of the COVID-19 quarantine. For those of you who are visiting us for the first time this morning, please let me take a moment to introduce you to our congregation. Unitarian Universalist congregations are unlike many other spiritual groups in that we don't have a common creed that defines what we all believe. You'll find that Unitarian Universalist beliefs cover the spectrum, Christian, pagan, agnostic, Buddhist, atheist, humanist, and those who are still searching. What we do share is a common set of values, a covenant about how we should treat each other and the world. We share values such as inclusion, upholding the worth of each individual, and affirming democracy. We are a welcoming congregation. This means we welcome everyone to join us, no matter your color, your ability, your age or financial status, no matter your place on the gender spectrum, whoever you are, whoever you love, wherever you come from, we're glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, Brittany here. I've been asked to share with you about the impact that the Unitarian Universalist community has had on my life and how after, well not how, why after um, over a decade away I chose to return to um, our Cleveland UU community uh, not only as a member but as a religious education teacher for the middle schoolers. Um, I figured I'd use this time to address what I know best, um, and that is the youth community that Unitarian Universalism has that's just absolutely incredible. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I was born and raised in this church when it was first Unitarian Universalist of Cleveland. My name is on that senior high wall. I stood on that stage for many uh, church musical as well as participated at a district level um, for YAC and Ohio Meadsville district conferences. I planned worships. I went through my own rites of passage and um, shared my senior speech on that um, in that sanctuary space, as well as had many uh, of amazing weekend car washes, lock-ins, haunted houses. And I can't even begin to tell you how much being a youth in the UU church community uh, shaped my life. Probably in so many ways I don't even fully realize. Um, the Unitarian Universalist community and the adults within it, you know, they gave me a huge gift. They channeled my energy. They taught me how to use my voice and leverage my passion for community, for friendship, for spirituality. Um, into amazing channels and activities and um, I think one of the really cool things that um, it gave me is it taught me how to practice my principles in my everyday life um, you know I always share with my friends you know when they ask what Unitarian Universalism is which is a question I've gotten a lot <laughs> since I left um, you know I share with them that you know it's kind of just being a good person um, and I do share the principles and they're like, well, that feels like what I am. And that feels like who I was growing up. I just didn't know it and I didn't have a space. And I just think that hits the nail on the head um, for me and really solidified how I felt. You know, so many of us who grew up in the UU church, um, whether we've stayed part of the UU community or not, there's this connection and there's this um, mindset and worldview that we all were raised with 
um, where we recognize each other's voices and we, we lift each other up and we share um, emotionally, spiritually, um, we build community with each other. And whether we've been a part of a physical church or not since we've left First UU, um, we carry that with us. So I think that's really the biggest reason I came back to this church um, when I moved back to Cleveland, it was really easy for me to say yes when Alan asked me to be a religious education teacher um, and say yes when people ask me to do something um, and create time and space for it because I know how much this community gave to me and taught me when I was at a really formidable age and how it recognized my voice um, and gave me skills to use it in a very positive way. And so that's why I'm here. That's why I continue to be part of this community as an adult, is to be the adult I had as a youth for the up and coming youth. Um, and I think that is the biggest gift any of us as adults can, as members of this community, is to just continue to be present and show up and whether we're directly involved with the youth or not to build, keep building and sustaining a community where everybody is welcome and every voice is heard, no matter how old you are. Um, I think that's, you know, the heart of Unitarian Universalism for me and why I continue to be part of this community um, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. Um, I hope you all are staying safe and well. I look forward to being back in our space together. Um, and I hope you all are practicing your spirituality at home and sharing with each other however you can at this time of distance. Curtis Tyrone Jones wrote, Sometimes we find the sweetest solidarity in the midst of solitude. As we light our chalice this morning, we come together from our solitary places into the sweet solidarity of this hour of worship. Morning, I'm Reverend Joe of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. I'd like to welcome you into our worship this morning where we're going to be talking about the interplay between solitude and solidarity. So without further ado, let me welcome you into our sanctuary. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at May I be whole. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be filled with loving kindness. 
may want us to be afraid. They want us to be afraid of leaving our homes. They want us to barricade our doors and hide our children. Their aim is to make us fear life itself. They want us to hate. They want us to hate the other. They want us to practice aggression and perfect antagonism. Their aim is to divide us all. They want us to be inhuman. They want us to throw out our kindness. They want us to bury our love and burn our hope. Their aim is to take all our light. They think that their bricked walls will separate us. They think that their damned bombs will defeat us. They are so ignorant they don't understand that my soul and your soul are old friends. They are so ignorant they don't understand that when they cut you, I bleed. They are so ignorant that they don't understand that I will never be afraid, will never hate, and we will never be silent, for life is ours. I'd like to invite you into a moment of meditation and stillness as I share these words. For most of my life, I wasn't much of a hugger. Handshakes were fine, unless we were related. It's not that I didn't like people, because I do, but hugs felt too close, too personal, too intimate. But seminary changed that for me. I guess I should credit my seminary friends for that. They hugged each other all the time and dragged me, at first unwillingly, into hugs. In week five or six or seven, depending on where you are, of physical distancing, I find my mind wanders to hugs. Right now, I can't even see friends face to face, sit in a room with them, except a chat room, and hear their voices through not analog, but only digital means. I can't feed them or offer them tea, nor they me, relegated as we are to six feet with a mask on, or through a tiny camera I can hardly see on my phone or tablet or TV. I sometimes found hugs to be awkward. Who initiates? Who receives? Was that a move into a hug or a handshake? But on that first day when we can safely hug, I will ask permission so that there is clarity, so that every hug can be of exquisite mutuality.
Good morning. So here's an installment from what could uh, really be like a series called something like the spirituality of internet memes or something like that. Um, in the past few weeks, the internet gave birth to a little quarantine mental experiment that has, uh, unsurprisingly, spread like wildfire throughout social media, as these things so often do. So, here's the game. You're given five or so house scenarios with different people in them, and you have to choose where you'd like to spend the quarantine, basically. Simple enough, right? So here's an example of one. Uh, that's pretty much what you'd expect. A bunch of sort of celebrities and famous people to choose from. They kind of show up at random. But pretty quickly, it becomes really clear that each of these houses have some pretty cool people that would be really great to hang out with. And then there's some others that would be a real trial. So, for example, like, I love Mindy Kaling, and I think it would be really, really interesting to hang out with her. But would her company be enough to cope with also having to be around Dr. Phil all day? Yikes. Uh, another another part of this this one is David Blaine and Kanye West are in the same house as Oprah Winfrey. I, I can't even imagine the energy of that house. Of course, this is uh, the internet. So eventually, you know, as this developed, there are all kinds of other scenarios that came out to choose from. So you could choose, for example, which Star Wars house would you like to be in? I feel like Han Solo would have some good stories. But there'd be, you know, real tension if Boba Fett was there, too. You can also look at um, which fictional characters from books and literature you'd like to spend time with. And this gets even harder because I feel like we actually know characters um, better than we know, um, like, famous people. So, for example, oh, I love the idea of, like, seeing Samwise Gamgee from Lord of the Rings and see him chat about gardening with T'Challa, the Black Panther, King of Wakanda. But in this scenario, I would also have to be spending time with Dolores Umbridge from the Harry Potter series, maybe one of the most evil characters uh, in fiction. Um, here's one where the stakes get really serious. So for all of you NPR listeners and uh, news hounds out there, contemporary Democratic Party figures. Talk about negotiating some pretty intense interpersonal dynamics. And here's one I know our music-loving congregation could really get into. Famous composer quarantine houses. And in this one, they're actually broken up by genre type. So you'd, you'd probably also be asking yourself, what kind of music would you be okay listening to, you know, nonstop for the duration of your time at home? Okay. So this is a dumb internet thing, right? Um, a great little distraction uh, to spend a little time with. And maybe that's good enough. But a question uh, I bring to this meme is, what does the fact that we have thought up and shared this meme tell us about how we're thinking about and making sense of the solitude we're all experiencing right now? So it's interesting, for example, to note that every version of these houses entail some amount of compromise. And that's the way we experience people too, right? You probably have that friend or family member, somebody who you you really love and enjoy, except maybe they have that one thing about them uh, makes it tough to spend time with them. Maybe it's their politics. Maybe they have some bad or annoying habits. But even so, you stick with them because the connection matters. And that tells us that we actually care about people more than the sum of their opinions and their habits. It's also interesting to see how the the tricky part about thinking through some of these house choices are actually the interpersonal dynamics that are there whether you would be there or not, right? The weird part of this game for me is the way that it makes us all realize that we never quite lose our worries and our anxiety about fitting in, making sure there's room for us, even in this completely unrealistic sort of fantasy scenario, the worry sticks with us because if we weren't aware of it before now, we certainly are now. We can't really exist without other people, even when those people drive us absolutely crazy. I'm thinking about that old uh, saying they always uh, uh, bring up when we're talking about interpersonal relationships. They say um, that you can, you, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. 
Well, the reality is for most of us, we can't actually choose our quarantine houses either. And even if we could, the company that we chose eventually, no matter how many people it were to be in our house, no matter how interesting they might be, no matter what stories they would have to tell, eventually they would get on our nerves and we'd feel stir crazy and we'd all feel alone sometimes. And I think that has to be the biggest lesson to take, both from this meme and what this meme is talking about. Maybe what matters about this experience is what it can do for thinking about our lives beyond the quarantine. Maybe the lesson we're all being confronted with in our solitude now is that the lives we live with other people are always wrapped up in our values and our priorities and the things that matter most to us. We've all been forced to take a step away from our lives here in ways that we could never have anticipated. I think, you know, if we don't come through this experience without taking the chance to reflect on what matters most about how we spend our days and who we spend them with, even when we have the freedom to do whatever we'd like, maybe we missed a lesson that comes only once in a lifetime. Each week, we come together as a people. Together, we share stories, love, aspiration. We also share our bounty in ways that express our religious UU values. May this important ritual of sharing abundance remind us that making our world better is a task best shared. This morning's wisdom from the Global Scripture is Overture Lily Pads by Anne Lamont. My coming to faith did not start with a leap, but rather a series of staggers from what seemed like one safe place to another. Like lily pads round and green, these places summoned me and then held me up while I grew. Each prepared me for the next leaf on which I would land, and in this way I moved across the swamp of doubt and fear. When I look back at some of these early resting places, the boisterous home of the Catholics, the soft armchair of the Christian science mom, adoption by ardent Jews, I can see how flimsy and indirect a path they made. Yet, each step brought me closer to the verdant pad of, of faith on which I somehow stay afloat today. You may be asking yourself, 
why is Reverend Joe sitting in our empty sanctuary? Well, the truth is, it's part of the theme of today's service. You see, I've been playing all week with the two words, solidarity and solitude. Because of the times that we're in right now, both words are really on the forefront of many people's minds. And so by being solitary, I am acting in solidarity with all the people I hope are safe and sound. Our governor, our doctors, and other professionals keep telling us to stay home, to stay out of groups larger than the people we live with, if we can help it. And so I've come today to church, to the building, where I'm by myself in this fairly large sanctuary, wishing you were all here with me, but knowing that this act of solitude is actually not so sad, but really a demonstration of care. When I was talking to Mike and Alan about this dance between the words solitary and solitude, I discovered on my own that both words were rooted in Middle French, but I couldn't trace it back farther than that. And as sometimes happens when you're talking to friends, Mike said, well, they mean one, like solo in Latin. And you would think that with all of my years of musical training, I would have thought of that. So how can one be both alone and together with all of their people. I guess there's technology. It's not the same, of course, but it does allow for some togetherness. I have so enjoyed the Reverend Joe's virtual cat phase that we've been having four times a week and seeing all the people, and frankly, meeting three or four new people who don't normally make it to Sunday services, but who've popped by. And that's been pretty great. Um, I've gotten to know some folks more, because for a while anyway, there was just themselves and me in the room. Sometimes the group turned to music because, weirdly, there were only musicians in the room. Another time, um, at my expense, it turned into um, talk of gardening and how little I actually know about gardening because I confessed that I had started some seeds in one of those little driffy trays, things, and I don't know anything about gardening. Um, so people were patient and kind and generous with information. Um, one comment I got was, wow, I've never started corn indoors before. Let me know how that goes which made me feel like my corn was doomed. But we'll see what happens. Um, another time, the conversation got very theological. One time we talked about what life lessons we learned in airports. So it's clearly a way that we have been together and apart, both in solidarity, and in solitude. 
earlier, I read a poem for the meditation about hugs. I'm feeling kind of sad about hugs right now. I don't live alone, for which I'm grateful. But I miss seeing people. I miss seeing your faces. I miss being at the door and shaking your hand and saying, good morning, which I hope you all know I mean with sincerity when I say either good morning or welcome or come on in with hopefully a twinkle in my eye. It comes from deep inside me. And I really miss seeing you guys on Sundays. So I have to let myself feel that sadness of missing you. I have to stop being busy and set up the phone slash camera in this big empty room and think about you. This is something that I can do by myself for the good of the whole. This is a solitary act, an absolute solidarity with those who are important to me. I hope that you find ways to connect with people that feel as genuine as the cafes have felt for me, even though every session somebody is on mute or someone can't figure out the camera, the connection is real. And eventually, the mute gets worked out, the camera works, and we can see their beautiful face. We've seen so many folks in the cafe. I hope that you'll consider coming to one soon, because then you too can be both solitary and in solitude. No, both solitary and in solidarity with everyone else here. I know it seems like a long pause there, but I'm just imagining you here with me and me seeing all your faces. It's a beautiful sight and I look forward to it again. Please take care of yourselves, those you love. Let yourself feel sad when it's time for that. And also look for the little moments of joy to carry you through. nurses and doctors, every medical staff bent over flesh to offer care, for lives saved and lives lost, for showing up either way. 
praise for the farmers tilling soil, planting seeds so food can grow, an act of hope if ever there was. Praise be the janitors and garbage collectors, the grocery store clerks and the truck drivers barreling through long, quiet nights. Give thanks for bus drivers, delivery persons, postal workers, and all those keeping an eye on water, gas, and electricity. Blessings on our leaders making hard choices for the common good, offering words of assurance. Celebrate the scientists working a way to understand the thing that plagues us to find an antidote and all the medicine makers. Praise be the journalists keeping us informed. Praise be the teachers finding new ways to educate children from afar and blessings on parents holding it together for them. Blessed are the elderly and those with weakened immune systems, all those who worry for their health, praise for those who stay at home to protect them. Blessed are the domestic violence victims on lockdown with abusers, the homeless and refugees. Praise for the artists and poets, the singers and storytellers, all those who nourish with words and sound and color. Blessed are the ministers and therapists of every kind, bringing words of comfort. Blessed are the ones whose jobs are lost, who have no savings, who feel fear of the unknown nine. Blessed are those in grief, especially who mourn alone. Blessed are those who have passed into the great night. Praise for police and firefighters, paramedics, and all who work to keep us safe. Praise for all the workers and caregivers of every kind. Praise for the sound of notifications, messages from friends reaching across the distance. Give thanks for laughter and kindness. Praise be our four-footed companions with no forethought or anxiety, responding only in love. Praise for the seas and rivers, forests and stones who teach us to endure. Give thanks for your ancestors, for the wars and plagues they endured and survived. Their resilience is in your bones and your blood. Blessed is the water that flows over our hands and the soap that helps keep them clean, each time a baptism. every moment of stillness and silence so new voices can be heard. Praise the chance and slowness. Praise be the birds who continue to sing the sky awake each day. Praise for the primrose poking yellow petals from dark earth. Blessed is the air clearing overhead so one day we can breathe deeply again. And when this has passed, may we say that love spread more quickly than any virus ever could. May we say this was not just an ending, but also a place to begin. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together once again.